Well, <laughs> as Mike mentioned at the very top of the show, we are very fortunate to have a guest, uh, guest with us in the studio today who actually just happened to be passing through our <laughs> neck of the woods Four hours onto, away. onto a conference That's that right. we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, Mike McLean, sitting to my right here, is a member of one of the ISO's uh, Technical Management Group Task Force. And we'll talk about what that task force does here in just a little bit. And these, uh, if you haven't heard the ISO management uh, I'm sorry, the ISO's Technical Management Board. Uh, the, the management, management Board is the government's body, uh, mm -hmm. government's body for ISO that's responsible for the general management of the technical committee structure within ISO. So it's kind of a, a, a you know, kind of a bureaucratic oversight kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike is the Australian representative and convener for the task force for the ISO uh, test Technical Management Board group for the integrated use of management system standards handbook. And we'll get go. to that handbook in just a bit because I think it's really important. And he's going to give us some uh, insight into the, uh, uh, the benefit and the purpose of ISO's high level structure. And then we'll also talk about the handbook in just a little bit. So let's start off with the high level structure. Mm. First of all, why don't you tell us just briefly what is the high level structure or the HLS or Annex SL? I think those are <laughs> okay. all, all, all kind of synonyms. Um, the high level structure was actually uh, from an ISO directive. The ISA directive had a number of um, guidance documents for technical standard writers and uh, task forces, working groups, which uh, I'm participating in. So in this particular case, Annex SL was just one of those in within the ISA directives to say, of those people that are writing management system standards, we thought we'd do what our name is. The ISA means the International Organization for Standardization. So as my wife would say, here come you consultants talk about process or process and you don't do it yourself. And I've written books on problem solving, but I still have problems on my slice and my golf. So <laughs> she brings it up every time. So I have problems. Uh, so then ISO took its own medicine. So they said, why don't we have some s kind of standardized structure for writing management system standards? And so what we do, we get a copy of this kind of guidelines and it has core text and some requirements. And when it comes into a special part where oil and gas or quality or environment has to put their bit in, uh, there's just an XXX and you just insert those requirements. So it gives flexibility for the standard writers and it was pretty good. Uh, the basis of that was that hopefully people would say, Geez, there seem to be some common elements across a number of standards. You know, quality environment in 2017, we'll see ISO 45001 for occupational health and safety come out but there's been asset management, energy management standards. And so people thought, geez, they were all very similar. And so so they mm. wanted, basically they wanted a way to make sure that, mm. uh, that kind of all of these standards had a, a somewhat similar structure, right? So yeah. that they, they could all, I'm assuming, in, uh, so that they could all kind of relate to each other in some sort of way? And that's a good uh, thing. They have to relate so that if you wanted to build an integrated management system, the idea of previous things called public available specifications from British Standards Institute, um, they have PAS 50, PAS 55, PAS 99, and they've been quite good to get people to understand those particular in industries. And then we thought, well, I say thought, how, how do people consolidate all those requirements and then overlay them, so to speak, or to embed them or integrate them into their processes or processes? And so what they thought was, well, we've consolidated them now. Uh, all of them now are a high level structure thing. It makes it easy. Um, efficient, effective for people to see, ah, oh, that's interesting, quality, environment, safety, and all those types of ones, they have common cores and common kind of words about the requirements, but just there's little nuances for environmental um, infrastructure and things that right. you may kind want kind for your... Kind of tweak them the way they need. Yeah. And, and let me interrupt you for, for a little bit here. I, we mentioned that we, you could, if you had any questions on the HLS mm -hmm. or uh, the IUMSS that you can send them to us, we do have a question uh, that came in, so let's go ahead and throw that up on the screen. And yeah, by the way, I'll just leave that there. If you have a question, send it to qdl at qualitydigest.com. And the first question is, can I, oh boy, can I use the high level structure to document my QMS? Ooh, and I think question. I've uh, seen pros and cons to this. Uh, how do you answer that question? Ah, some organizations have done this. And as a first step, one could say that would be a great learning and uh, type of medium to say that I've looked at a standard I've understood what the requirements are. I've written a so-called documented information. It could be in a quality manual, as you know from IATF 16949, it yeah. does require a quality manual. 
but you could write it and then you're saying, hmm, wait a minute, there's a clause there, 4.41, and there's another clause, 5.1c. It says I have to kind of show the interface and the interrelationship between my processes. So a flow chart's very good. It shows the, you know, where it goes and connections. That's good for understanding the process. And then it says under 4.41 that you have to understand also and document your inputs and outputs. So the procedures or work instructions then would give you greater granularity at a deeper level within that flow chart to show the inputs a supplier gives me an input to do some transformation to produce an output. Uh, the SIPOC in ISO 9001, for example, is very powerful. So you can kind of use it to understand it, but in the end, it should be just then parked, so to speak, and then have a look at your business processes and see where those kind of now requirements you've understood, can I embed them into my business processes? And that gives you better control um, from Dr. Deming and Duran, process stability perhaps, uh, better control, better assurance that you're meeting some requirement. So, so if, 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 I, if I can kind of read into what you're saying here a little bit, it sounds like you're saying that, well, if you wanted to use the HLS as a template and just try to plug everything into it, that you could do that as long as you met all the requirements of everything else. I mean, obviously there's a lot of requirements mm. you have to meet. You could do that, but kind of why would you? What's the, yeah. what's the value in <laughs> it? Right. Is that is that? That's basically it, uh, Dirk, because it's, it's very powerful to read a standard, whatever standard you're meeting in, in whatever industry, and probably write it out. So you've got to understand it. But then when you read it, you then realize, wait a minute, we run our business by processes. We have to produce an output. How can we have better control? How do we meet customer satisfaction? How do we meet our interested parties' needs and expectations? We have to do continual improvement. Well, you can't do continual improvement on a clause or a requirement. Right. You have to do continual improvement of your processes. Well, and, and you mentioned yeah. process, and, and actually before I get going, and Christopher, I've, I've lost audio on my headset here, so if another question comes in, just flag me at the door there if you don't mind. Um, so you mentioned processes, and one thing that I've, I've we do a lot of webinars, um, uh, various consultants mm. or registrars come in, they do webinars, and, and one of the questions that always comes up is, is auditing. So how does an auditor audit a process. I mean, I would think they could come in, they could very easily, in the old days when ISO 9001 was basically kind of a checkbox kind <laughs> of tick thing. Tick and flick. That's pretty, <laughs> yeah, tick and flick. That's pretty easy. But, you know, now you're saying, well, you know, it's not really, you're not using this template. The auditor's got to come in, they've got to look at your process, they've right. got to understand it. How the heck does that work for an auditor to really understand your process and see how it relates back to the standard? Respective standard. Um, there's two aspects of the ISO high-level structure which are very important for auditors. Uh, first of all is the internal auditor. The internal auditors, you still have to be competent, you have to be trained. The power and the value of an internal auditor now was because you have your processes defined and you have procedures to show you how you control that process. Um, that can be captured in an ISO 10005 quality plan. So you say, this is how we do things. So the internal auditor would be then going through and having a look at their processes and procedures as to whether the machines and gauges and office infrastructure is in place to deliver different activities within that process. Now that's the internal audit side, and that's a conformance. Do we conform to what we say we should do? Right. Um, like you're in United Airlines, do we conform to the policy, the procedures? Well, actually every airline has the same policy as United Airlines. Right. Um, just to back on that, there was another requirement that the airline, if they don't have that crew to meet the deadline at the other airport, they, they miss their slot and the cost to the business is, is very big. But there were risk mitigation things they could take. So the other part of ISO 9001, that talks about risk, mat, risk and opportunities and risk-based thinking. Mm -hmm. So within the risk-based thinking, there's no preventive action. But when you think about it, as that United Airlines type thing, every aspect of leadership, planning, support, you know, performance evaluation covered risk-based thinking. Maybe some people weren't really thinking through the downstream right. impact, but back, back to the internal audit. The internal audit is very powerful. Now, the management system or the business systems manager has to look at some meeting some external requirement. So the external requirement could be for quality, environment, safety, or it could be for something which has nothing to do with ISO. So our integrated use of management system standards is also recognizing 
that many organisations have to meet other standards, nothing to do with ISO, that might be for food, it might be for uh, transport responsibility, for anything, uh, RFID or some standard. So people operate their business internal audit ways, you have to meet those requirements, right. so to speak. If you want to seek certification or registration, well, let's just have a look at that standard and as to whether we should then go for a compliance. Do we comply to something? So the external order, right. the external order, and there's many tools and techniques that they can use. And I think, uh, Dirk, we might say that, that it's important now, it's an imperative that the external auditor really understands the industry. Well, and that, and mm. that was, I, I guess that's what I was getting to is, is that usually what happens? Is I mean, uh, I, you know, somebody comes. Let, let's say you're a, a you're a, uh, involved in the, in the food industry yeah. in some way. You know, you're a food packaging, or or you make cheese, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> if if the audit right. comes in, doesn't understand the food industry and you know HACCP and mm. all that sort of stuff, are they going to understand whether or not? your processes meet or don't meet the requirements of mm -hmm. ISO 9001. And, and I guess to, to extend that further, if as a company that's being audited, I'm thinking, this auditor doesn't seem like they <laughs> get what we do, is there anything you can do about it? Um, actually, there's the requirement by the registration uh, certification body that they are, uh, are required by their, their governance, as you said before, they are required to provide an auditor who actually knows that industry. That is a requirement and your registrar uh, bodies uh, here in the United States and around the world for Australia, it's JazzAns, they, they have to make sure that that certification body does provide the right auditor for the right industry. And it's a good point, I'm, I'm automotive, so I was trained in the United States. So if I went into a, a food company and I mentioned APQP, PPAP and FMEA, <laughs> and they're just gonna go, huh? what yeah. the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I have to kind of be, as a management consultant, because I'm not an auditor, I'd have to kind of understand the context of the organization, their processes, and understand how I can best apply some particular thing in regards, you know, some management practice. If I'm a lead auditor, I have to understand that standard. And what the businesses want is the benefit of an external auditor who understands the standard, but also my industry. So how can I use this kind of compliance requirement by a standard, and how can our processes better meet that? So the auditor can use a range of techniques, you've had them in the Quality Digest, no, turtle diagrams or bow tie diagrams or anything to kind of gather your processes, show me what you do, I'll write out what I think is required by this, also show me your documentation, have you integrated the requirements of a particular standard I'm going to look at, and then say, okay, let's have a look, I'm going to walk your process. So usually the internal auditor has already done that, and that's very powerful as a value add, you know, function divided by the price paid. But for the external auditor, when they finish that audit, they've walked the process, go to Gemba, so to speak. Then they come back to that business systems manager for whatever system they're putting in, and say, look, you are, you are doing what you're doing, but you could get better control by looking at this requirement of the standard. You said you did, but I couldn't find any evidence. So, and they have to read back the standard, and the business systems manager would then say, ah, oh, gee, we missed that. We missed that in our process. But what, but what you're saying is, I mean, that you keep on repeating is this idea that the ownership of the processes really belong to the company themselves hmm. that are to be audited. I mean, too many times I think companies want to offload that to the auditor and tell us what we're doing wrong or tell us what we should be doing. That's not the way it's supposed to work. No. I mean, you're supposed to own that yourself, and then the audit, the external audit, is really just a check that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's a good point, Mike. I think what's happened is the past that the, the quality manager or the environmental manager has been kind of decoupled from the main part of the business. And there is a narrative around now that how can we make the business systems manager part of the management review? So as Tom Peters said back in those in search of excellence days, if quality's not at the top of the agenda, you know, you're not serious about quality or anything like that. I think now there's an opportunity for the business systems manager to be at that table, to be at the, the C-suite. Are there any risk in my business? What happens to United Airlines? What happens if we make a decision that we're going to execute this on behalf of the security? Because if you, Tom Peters, you've accepted it, you've improved it. They approved that airport security. They approved of the policy. So therefore, we can't necessarily blame the, the, the person, so to speak. And as uh, Dr. Deming, you says you blame the process, not the person. Well, the red bead experiment. Bead experiment. <laughs> and, and that's part of the thing. So 
the, the business systems manager now has an opportunity to be at the table, but also the, the companies would see value in that business systems manager, giving us a more eclectic, holistic view of how we're not meeting or are meeting requirements for some standard. And instead of just being uh, tick, flick, and just forget about it. Well, do you mm. think most, do you think, in your experience, do you think that most auditors understand how to audit to the process approach? <laughs> Uh, 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 what would you say, I mean, how would you say, like 50-50% are doing it right, or 70% are doing it right? Or <laughs> um, once again, that's a, that's a telling question, because the experience has been that there's, there's going to be a bit of a change for the auditors. Uh, some, some companies and clients that we have, and it's been the experience by our, our task force, so we've got some 30 nations on this, they have found what you've just said, that not all auditors actually understand this thing about process. They need to understand the standard and that's what businesses want. They want that auditor to really know the standard, but they also want us to know our business process, our industry. So right now in Milan, in Italy, there's a ISO uh, meeting and task force revising the, the auditing standards and so forth. I can tell you that there's a big issue about the competence and the competence of people and the auditors to understand the organization's processes so that they have to understand that industry, that sector, that culture, whatever the context is. Some of the organisations in the Middle East were found that they don't understand like even the context of the organisation. So it does say in ISO 9001, for example, which I'll get back to your point, um, notes two and three about external factors and internal factors. Well, those in strategy know, well, isn't that a bit like SWAT and Pestel? Yeah. And for some organisations that they, they, the executives, you know, they're millionaires. Yeah. They, they, they've never been to a university and they just said, Gee, this is really good stuff. And uh, how do I rank all these strengths, weaknesses and opportunities? Well, you just rank the weaknesses, rank the threats and then put them into your business plan. And oh, gee, that's a good idea. Is this all new knowledge? <laughs> no, but it's, so what's happening is the auditors are having to see, oh, is there a business plan? Some don't know what a business plan is. So there's a re-education of lead auditors in certification bodies going on right now. And when ISO publishes the revised standard for um, auditing and so forth, it's going to be a, an interesting time. And I think it's a great opportunity for the auditing fraternity to kind of lift their game. But it, it's coming to another thing. They're going to see more integrated management systems. Well, let's, let's talk mm. about that. Uh, so the reason you're out here actually yeah. is for a meeting you're going to in, in Michigan. Tell us about that and what, what that's all about. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, Milwaukee to uh, Johnson Controls. Uh, uh, Craig Williams and his team have um, organised us to be there. And um, there's a smaller task force now. We're just in the final stages of uh, updating the handbook. We've got a lot of the inputs. And what is the handbook? Uh, the handbook is the Integrated Use of Management System Standards, published in 2008. The high level structure came in kind of after that, and we've realised that we kind of have to refresh it. Um, the 15 case studies that we had, um, we're getting uh, some are continuing. They want to show that we've improved our process-based you know, or integrated management systems, but we've got some new case studies. And uh, the way with technology, you know, with I ICT and, um, you know, people use iPads, you can go into some organizations. Now, there's no documents. This is an iPad. Right. And there's click, do their job. Um, and one of the, my clients does that in a laboratory making biomedical DNA genome knocking, knock out mice. It's all done by an iPad. It's all timed. They also use nucleonics, so it's important to get it, the timing right. exposure, right. So, but basically organizations and what we've got, we've got a range of case studies which are going to be Im imported into this book and they're going to be used. And what's, what's the purpose? Of the, the purpose of the book is, is w why would I use this manual? What, what's this manual showing me? Right, so part of the, this issue of the Integrated Use of Management Systems Handbook was it was written basically around ISO stuff. Okay. So that the ISO standards, that's what we thought. But there's other standards. So every business operates their management system. They have a management system. Some seek certification to something external. So the or original book was basically focused on uh, management systems and ISO standards. And we've now realized that with uh, ERPs, uh, business process management, or um, ETOMs and ITIL3s and other oh, various standards, nothing to do with ISO sometimes, that organisations have to operate in this context. They have to meet some external requirement. So our handbook is now being revised. One is a construct around the high level structure, is a construct, but not to document. 
So the words in the ISO directive said, this is for ISO technical committees, working groups, to design a management system standard or whatever. It is not for organizations to document it. It actually says, this is only for us people in ISO. So what we're going to do, we've got all these case studies now at different parts of the handbook. We've got new uh, and refreshed process maps, process matrices. We're integrating some performance evaluation, a balance scorecard with Kaplan Norton's kind of being now accepted. So under performance evaluation, you could use that. So what's happening is we're also going to have this refreshing of a Jim the Baker case study. So we have to make it not just for developed nations, but for developing nations, for small businesses and big businesses. So this, the idea of the manual is it it's gives people an example of how if they have multiple hmm. management systems, how they, how they can all be pulled together. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah. I'm the still trying to get my head around what the manual's yeah. going to do f for me, for instance. Um, the reason we have so many case studies is that you will see different varieties of ways of doing it. There's no one right way to do an integrated management system or one, or some people call it, just a single management system. Okay. Um, this is the way we reoperate our business. So there's, there's, this kind of shows different ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could go about it this way, you could mm. go about it that way. It could be for one management system yep. or you could be trying to integrate uh, 18,001, 14,001 and 9,001 and mm you might take this kind of approach kind of yeah. thing, right? And some of the um, examples we've got are so uh, innovative and creative and just out of this world. Like there's one that's got a one page uh, kind of quality plan, but it's actual an integrated management plan. And it's, it's the, the whole manual in one A3 sheet. Mm -hmm. okay. And you think, my goodness, how does that work? Well, it does work because what they've done, all the backroom work has been done to show how various management system requirements have been embedded and integrated within their business processes. And then what they do is they put, publish this one page for everybody to understand, including a uh, plan on the page, which I do as a consultant. So business plans on a page now are quite popular. It's been around for years, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they might use three horizons or something. And you know, how do we put that together or blue oceans, red oceans and all that, and how do we compete? So you can see that our management systems are, are quite evolving and changing. So our handbook is also going to show how that happened. What it also does is Jim the Baker, which was just a small bakery we had in the, the original book. Well, Jim the Baker's kind of, it could stay what it is, but as you know, you come around here to Chico, you've got people that are an in-store bakery for one of the major retail stores. Sure. Sure. And so he might decide because his personal con situation or sh her po personal situation, either a husband or wife or family, they said, I might put my bakery onto an in-store one or I've got an opportunity to take over another bakery in Chico, or I might go to Sacramento, I might go somewhere else. So I could, because I'm so good at this, and this process is so good, I franchise it, just like you know, some coffee shop. Yeah. Right. So you have this thing, opportunity. So we had to embrace that. So we, we have to kind of show that Jim the Baker has an opportunity to do franchising or something like that. So we're not, we're not kind of, saying that this is the way. It's no one right way. And when, when does the revision uh, come up? Um, well, my, uh, my task by the end of uh, next Friday, or I should say my team's task, is that uh, our team <laughs> is meant to have a, a draft of this finished by Friday next week in Milwaukee. We also have a survey. We have the Integrated Use of Management System uh, Questionnaire Survey. It's been going around the world mm -hmm. and people can still participate in that. How do they do that? Um, they just go online as a survey monkey. So I'll, okay. I'll show you, uh, give you the link. Yep. Uh, we're getting some amazing responses. Yeah, at, we'll post that. We'll share that. We'll share that. For and it's been quite refreshing. And, and so, you know, sometimes you think, oh, this is what will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. we've got so much diverse point of view. So we're going to have that done by uh, Friday. We have to consolidate that, consolidate that. On Wednesday next week, the American Society for Quality has also been very gracious. They're putting on... Um, I'm not sure about bagels, but you know, <laughs> they, they got us having a, a, a half a dozen to 10 organizations from the Milwaukee area, the region, and they're coming into, we're going to conduct a focus group. So we're going to put up the aspects of what we've drafted of the handbook now, some of the case studies, some of the approaches, and also get their feedback of what they think is real. We've done this in Australia with a company, which is a bakery, uh, and that little company, uh, uh, Pinnacle Ingredients down there in Sydney, they, they're not ISO, yeah. but they have to meet HACCP. They have to meet food standards for Woolworths and Coles and all these patisseries. So 
but now those people want fresh cream. Well, that changes your whole right. process because right. you've got something fresh. So we have to have small companies, medium-sized companies, companies that are multinational. So we want that feedback. So we're going to get that on Wednesday next week. So they're, uh, they're coming in. And then we have to present to the technical management board uh, around October, uh, likely in Sydney, and also the joint uh, uh, JTCG. There's a committee that kind of associated with that. And all this to get like the revisions into it. Yeah. That. And so then, then once, once the revisions are in and, and everything's in there, uh, this is actually a document that'll be downloadable from, from, I, from the ISO website, I'm assuming? Uh, for a fee. Oh, right. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the original one, you can't even find it on the um, ISO website. Right. So the handbook is, was quite substantive before. We're yeah. going to kind of break it up a little bit better. And also, uh, a lot of the companies that have participated in the survey have given us a link to their system. Okay. So you can directly contact them. Mm. Um, we're not sure about putting the web links in because, as you know, sometimes the web link changes. And, right, right. And in but are, are you saying that this, this, the manual will be available this time from, from ISO at some point for a fee? Oh, yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah, will okay. be. And that's the objective. We have to get that through. It has to go through the review by uh, a high level uh, group, the governance of the TMB. Uh, we well, I directly report to them, okay. uh, which is a, an onerous task. And we have to be cognizant of what they say to fix it. So there's some people back to the high level structure. Yep. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get some people, why isn't like the high level structure? Right, right. Where's PDCA? And, and other people will have their point of view, which is what we have to do. And I suppose being Australian, we have to kind of be in the middle. So <laughs> we've got the Asian context, we've got the European, right, right. and now we've got Brexit, you know, and now we've got other things that have happened around the world. It's a, and I, I do work for the, uh, the Department of Defense in Australia and the different um, services. So cyber security is big, information security has come in, ISO 27001. So we have to be kind of right. kind of eclectic and holistic about it. And so, I, mm. so, so we'll, we'll keep our eyes open. We've got, we got, we got to go now. But, oh, so um, yeah. so uh, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open. Yeah. So they should, be, they should just check into ISO. Yeah. It'll, it'll be called the IUMSS. Yeah. Yeah. Probably if they just go into ISO and Google. Yeah, that'll oh, come no, out we'll by. We'll, we'll, ISO search and box we'll post the survey. Uh, and we'll post the survey. Oh, yeah, that'll be really great, uh, Mike. Uh, People who are well. watching on demand will be able to check that out as well. Okay. Well, oh. Mike, thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks. I appreciate it. We could stuff. talk about this for a long time, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're running out here. Thanks very much. Okay. All right.